Next topic is, um, after now we've talked about the edges, now we need to talk about formalizing the edges. Um, that's done using uh, things like contract and policy. One very highly debated field. There's two factions in the, well, there's many factions in the web services field, right? Just to serve it. There's two factions in the SOAP web services field in terms of how do I implement the service right? There's the code first division, and then there's the contract first division. I think that split makes no sense whatsoever because they're all talking about the same thing, but they just have different viewpoints. In reality, there's two types of people. There's, type, there's the, uh, I call it, <clears throat> it's typically being called the Aaron and Tim uh, faction. Um, two guys uh, who work at the uh, plural side, and uh, it's, uh, and they're, they're all for XML. They have the deep love for angle brackets, right? They want to look at XML all day because it charms them. They love it, right? Then there is the the other faction that I'm I'm in, right? And a lot of other people. And the and let's let's call this the Clemens and Juval section. Juval Logi was a great friend of mine. And if we can if we can not look at a single anchor bracket, yeah, our day has been a better day. <coughs> we hate XML, at least to look at, right? If it ha happens under the covers and it goes across the wire, we're happy with that. Do I want to really see it in my face? No, I think it's ugly. I think it's, people say it's human readable. That's right, is it human understandable? Well, that's, 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 that's a different story. Um, so that's, that's, that's one split that we have. Of course, then we have the other split that we just saw, uh, Achim discussed, the rest, the whole rest story, which I'm currently um, somewhat involved in because I'm uh, writing a set of extensions to Indigo to make rest easier. Um, the rest proponents, most notably po folks like Mark Baker, is in Canada and he's one of the most outspoken rest proponents, um, those folks now think I'm their fan, right? And I'm trying to make uh, the world use REST for everything. That's not true. I'm just completely neutral. I was so pragmatic that I'm saying, you know, if it fits your purpose, just use it. You don't have to use, your, use SOAP. I'm okay with SOAP. I think it has um, a greater, wider um, usage potential than, than just plain HTTP with plain XML payloads. But in fact, I don't care, right? If, if, if a certain thing suits your specific purpose, go use it. I am absolutely non-dogmatic. It turns out that <clears throat> while we're talking about the Microsoft stuff, um, that the Indigo team, that's the next, the next wave of or sorry, Windows Communication Foundation, right? The Windows Communication Foundation, short, shorthand Indigo, <laughs> um, that was built as the realization of Microsoft's SOAP vision in that being a little dogmatic, right? By now, people like Steve Swartz, who's one of the most undogmatic architects I know, along with a bunch of other people, have caused change in Microsoft to open up Indigo in a way and then to enlist uh, dumb volunteers like me uh, and actually you know, showing people how to do that, um, that it doesn't really matter what style you use. If you favor REST, you're, you're going to have in short time, I'm currently just laying it out all on, on, on my blog, how it works, so you can simply copy the code down from for my web blog, and that's going to be a downloadable thing in probably just around uh, year's end, in two weeks, um, that you can simply write REST services very easily with Indigo without any SOAP packages. If you want to send uh, an MPEG file of uh, four gigabyte through an Indigo channel, fine, my extensions help you do that. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the representation is. So there's a bunch of camps, and I'm 
neutral to most of those camps. And I'm, I'm sitting there smiling, being happy, if someone comes around being very dog dogmatic and says, the world has to be like this, because it doesn't. People have different opinions, and, and my goal and my role probably is to um, help everybody to achieve their goals as they, as they like to see the world, right? Um, and if they're being overly stupid, right, and I can see it, and I'm thinking that they may be stupid, I can give them a slight hint, but in the end, in the end, it's not my job to tell you how to write your apps. You have brains for yourself. I can just uh, just to create ideas, or to help you create ideas, or to reinforce your thinking, even. So, for all those different styles, we need to have a way to communicate. What are we going to do? How do we how do we sit together and 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 discuss what are we going to exchange in terms of of um, Data. How are we going to exchange it, and then how are how are we going to manifest that start that information, so that we can exchange that, so we can drive applications, so we can build applications based on that. Contract and policy are the two things to do that. Um, you may you will have heard about WSDL, W S D L. I've mentioned it a few times. It's a web service description language, and it's one of those tools. Um, and you, if you have used um, Com or ActiveX at any time in the, uh, the past or now, you will be very familiar with the concept of interfaces, which is a very similar thing. Um, let's talk about contracts in a little more abstract way first, and then we're going to get back to those things. So the idea of contracts is that we enable loose coupling through proper design and user for contracts instead of binary dependencies. But that means we want to define clearly what, 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 what are we going to communicate. At the same time, we want to build some flexibility into the contracts, which means that the contract allows for future change. You build change, the changeability into your contract, into the negotiation about which data you're going to exchange. You shall, software should never express absol the absolute wisdom. Right? Shall never express the absolute truth. It shall never say um, a name is composed of a first name and a middle name and a last name. It should never make the first name and the middle name mandatory fields. There could people be with multiple middle names. There could be people with just one name and they don't have a have a last name, they don't have a first name, right? There's absolute, absolute truth coded into software. Um, it should be flexible. It should be okay with either, either one. You have to put a little thinking into it. And you should never think that the data you're collecting is complete. And you always have to prepare the software to, to allow yourself to be a little wiser than you are today when you wake up tomorrow, right? And it would be it would be stupid not to allow it, to allow yourself to do that. So, contract shall allow everybody involved to become a little bit wiser when you wake up tomorrow. We need to enable robustness by agreeing on operational standards and express those standards in some way and exchange those operational behaviors in some way. Uh, probably operational behaviors that are so subtle that they just control infrastructure functionality, uh, a special way how, how transactions work. These are things which are hardly interesting to anybody uh, around the table, but they're interesting to the infrastructures that drive them. Um, and, and that's something that's really out of the scope of the whole technology story, establish reliability and accountability by it finding measurable service quality levels. That's something that you, that you achieve by instrumenting your application, by measuring your application, and then have written down contracts, contracts between companies, contracts between service providers, that state, we guarantee you a 99 point, and then the number of, the number of nines, the number of nines you're willing to pay for, et cetera, et cetera. That's what you, we guarantee you. That's not necessarily a function of the software implementation or something that you express in a contract that's, or in a 
machine readable contract. That's numbers you put down in a real contract because you can put so much technology stuff out there. If the other side is down half of the year, it doesn't help you. So there's got to be financial penalties, you know, the whole array of bad things you can do between companies. That needs to be written down. It needs to be written down how secure is the data? Where's that data being kept? Uh, is there a steel cage around the server which is locked down in the nuclear safe bunker replicated to the other nuclear safe bunker out on the other side of the world? Blah, 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 right? All of those things need to be written down on paper. That's nothing that we can really control. That's a, that's a legal thing, right? This is for your enterprise architect to sit down with the CIO and a bunch of lawyers and write that down. But that has to be done as well. And this, the input for this, for the requirements need to be fed to uh, that legal team. But that's part of the story, right? You cannot, you cannot build a widely distributed system where multiple companies and multiple providers are collaborating without having proper, proper contracts in place. And then you need to know what your reliability requirements are. Because any solution that you build which relies on third-party components, especially when there are services, is only as reliable as the total solution is, including someone else's solution. The application will only be as scalable as everybody's components are scalable, and so on and so on and so on. So things to lay down in that, in that sort of contract is reliability and uptime. Guaranteed response time, uh, number of users or number of hits, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All those criteria are belonging into a contract. And if you look at contracts from get service level guarantees to getting from public web service providers, let's take the most the better known ones: Google, Amazon, etc. Those things are spelled out in the contracts, are spelled out in the EULA, so you can you can get for them. Amazon, for instance, tells you exactly you are getting. 10 books per second, period. <clears throat> and they actually throttle this down. They throttle an individual account down to that maximum amount. That's the public stating that's what they're doing. They're doing that for two, for two reasons. A, they don't want you to come with a fire hose, right, with a big pipe and suck their, their catalog dry in a few minutes using a big pipe. Second, they want to give you and everybody else a fair share of their bandwidth, right? And that's and this is the service guarantee you're getting. Are you getting any guarantee on them supplying that service? No. Are you getting any guarantee that they won't switch this off tomorrow? No. eBay also has service level guarantees. So just to, to get an idea, it makes sense, go and download those licenses and really read them, right? These are not... I know how it all is, right? Download, next, next, done, install, right? Who reads those contracts anyways? These are particularly interesting. So, contracts illustrated. Here is something that's an eye-opener for, for many people, so um, that's an interesting part. We have two services. Until now, you may still have the picture in your, in your mind that a service is, there's a service and there's a client. I argue there's no clients. Everything is a service, right? You have a presentation service that interacts with the user, and the presentation that service that interacts with the user, well, the, you, can use, you can see the user as another service that gets, and the user gets visual messages, right? and acts on those visual messages by entering data, which then again is transformed into messages. See, it, it, it takes to the extreme. But everything is a service. <clears throat> Given that everything is a service, we need to look at how things communicate. It turns out that communication is no unidirectional thing. It's not a request-response world. And this is where the whole story about uh, web services are just RPC and it's just the same thing that we had before completely failed. It's not. Web services are, or services are generally about messaging in any direction. So here we have, you know, this could be everything. Let's assume this is a purchasing, a purchasing 
thing. You send a message to a purchasing service. This is the buyer, this is the seller. And you're waiting for the purchase order confirmation. Getting an order confirmed could take a millisecond, but it could also take four days or a week, depending what you're ordering. Right? If I order um, with a purchase order an Airbus A380, that's a little more complicated, and that's not going to happen in a second. Right? There's, I would probably not use, you know, not yet use electronic document exchange for ordering the Airbus Air 380, right? Probably for ordering a car, really, if I'm, if I'm a large company and I have a contract with uh, a, a mobility provider, how they call it now, um, I would uh, probably order cars using using method like this, and then I still, it still may, t takes time. This is not strictly a, a request response thing. I send a one-way message into a provider, and I say, I have negotiated in, ahead of time, once you have an answer for me, call me here. Send me the message back to a well-known endpoint. And so the communication goes on and on and on. And one session, if you will, could very well take years to complete, months to complete, weeks to complete, or milliseconds to complete. It all depends. But contract is a dual thing. A contract consists of two parties communicating which may be where the special case is that there is a master and a slave, if you will. And the master and the slave may only talk if its master raises its voice. That's, that's strictly request response. I ask you, you only talk when I ask you. That's a very specialized case which we see currently as the common case. Right? Everything is request response. But the more generalized case, the, the case that is actually more common in greater and bigger architectures, or should be more common in greater architectures, is a very flexible communication between all sorts of services with dual contracts, with doubled side contracts, because it makes more sense. Let me just show you a document that I had open, that I closed because I had to boot. There you have it. If you can't read it, get new glasses. No. It's too small. It's too small. It doesn't really matter if you can't read it because I'm going to read a few things to you. This is a canonical example that I'm using all the time. So uh, some of you may have already seen that. Um, but it illustrates a few things very nicely. This is a bookstore. Um, the website. The, the common bookstore website, or this is any commerce site, if you like. Um, the website is really this thing here, nothing more. Um, this, the, if you know the Duwamish example, for instance, from ASP.NET, um, that would be the scope of the Duwamish sample, right? Show a couple of things, let you click, to, uh, let you click a shopping cart, and then go and uh, submit the shopping cart. Once you place the order, this is where the system here gets interesting. So we have, we have. Um, Three pillars, that's the customer system, the, the, the order processing system, and the, the catalog system. It turns out that this system has a lot of different communication paths. It has pop sub, it has one way, it has duplex, and it has request response. Because all those scenarios are in there. And if they're in this solution, they're probably in every solution. So let's, let's pick out an example for, every, for, for everything. Um, the website shows catalog, okay? catalog information. There's a, a service running in the web server cluster, which is this here, the website catalog service, which has a catalog replica that it sits on. And uh, you walk up to the service and you say, please give me all books that um, are about um, archaeology. And it gives you all the books. And it gives you a pointer to all the pictures, and you can download the pictures, and you can assemble the page. Request response, I have the question, I get the response, that's, that's clear. Next path. I have a website order validation service. That, that uh, order validation service interacts with the web page, also request response, to check whether an order that's being submitted, 
thing. You take your shopping cart, you go to check, you proceed to checkout, and then you enter all your additional data and you say order now. That service interacts with the website to validate whether the order is plausible. Plausible meaning, do we have, uh, have all data to actually process the order? That doesn't mean that the credit card is valid. It will do a simple check on whether the, the credit card number is plausible for the provider. It means it has the right number of digits and the, the expiration date, the expiration date has been, hasn't expired, but it will not check, check any more of this. It will not go and inquire with the credit card provider. Right? It will not do any inventory checks. It will not do any of that. It will simply check whether the order is plausible, whether the prices are okay as according to the current catalog, uh, meaning that the shopping cart is not stale, um, whether the customer actually exists, whether that data is all there. And then it creates a purchase order, as you would create a purchase order if you were talking to the order service yourself using your own program, and then drops the order into the order fulfillment system, which may sit in a different data center in a one-way fashion, without any feedback whatsoever. It's a one-way thing. Because what we're showing our customer on the next page on the website is, your order has been received, thank you for your money, and that's it. If you do that on Amazon, do you get a confirmation that your order has been processed? No. They will send you an email, eventually. It's a one-way thing. What happens if, what would happen if the communication link broke down between those two, two parties? If the database engine blew up on this, on this side uh, while you store the order? What do you tell the customer? Uh, sorry, come back tomorrow. Um, we have, unfortunately, we have experienced a, a serious application fault in our backend application. Are you going to tell your customer any of that? Mm -hmm. Because if the customer says, order, yes, I have agreed to terms and conditions, blah, 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 that is money. That is cash. It's, that's stuff you want to keep. You, want to have, you don't want to have a, a message popping up saying, sorry, I can't take your money. That would be very stupid, right? Not taking money if it's offered to you. Especially saying that here, right? No. We'll take money when we can. So what we need here is a one-way link because there's nothing, nothing the service could say which this thing could, could ever fix, right? This has to check that it's plausible. So what we need here is we need to have a communication link that makes sure that nothing fails. And this is typically a message queue. A message queue makes guaranteed delivery. Come rain, firestorm, any of that. If you have the thing properly clustered and you don't have, if your building collapses because of an earthquake and takes the data center with it, well then it's a problem. Then you have a bigger problem than losing order. Right? But otherwise you can you can take reasonable measures against losing that order, and if and since it's transactional, even if you fail accepting it the first time because of a technical failure, you can recover it later because that's one of the qualities of this link, right? So this is a pure one-way one-way communication link. The other the other reason for making this a pure one-way communication link is also that the system shall function reliably all the time, even on the day. Remember, this is a bookstore, right? even on the day the new Harry Potter book comes out. Or on the day that I'll, I'll take, okay, I wish, I wish nobody anything bad, right? Nobody in the world. Let's assume one, a person that the whole world likes and loves um, has a problem on the street, right? Walks across the street and unfortunately a car, like an Israeli taxi driver, <laughs> right? Runs over it. Let's say it's one of the two remaining Beatles without, without naming any of the two. In that case, right, there will be an AP or any other news agency flash so and so killed, run over by a taxi. 
all of a sudden you will see a massive surge of requests on eBay, on Amazon, hell breaks loose. Because everybody wants to, wants to buy the last record, everybody wants to buy books, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden you get the sudden surge. Still, site can't go down. This is the reason for this architecture, right? If you, have a, if you put a queue in front of this, your system will run reliably on the predefined number of threads and this queue will grow. So that's, uh, we talk about contracts and we call, <coughs> talk about communication paths. Here's, a, here's also business reasons to do this, right? Scalability reasons to do this. this. This very reason actually goes back down here. From the order fulfillment service, I go to our invent, inventory service. Inventory service. The inventory service is responsible for distributing orders into inventories because we have warehouses all over the country. This is built for the US, right? So we have one in Houston, one in Chicago, one in New York, and one in Seattle. I am distributing based on the shipping address of the recipient. So I look at the zip code and throw it into, I see, oh, it starts with 9-8, so I throw it into the Seattle bucket. It's the next order comes in, I see it starts with 1-0, I throw it into the New York bucket. Uh, New York meaning, of course, at the warehouse in New Jersey, right? Um, <laughs> And uh, so I throw it into the bucket, and then I do this one way, because the warehouses also have stress, right? On the day that Harry Potter comes out, and the same day, the guy who gets run over by the car, and they have to supply, these are probably not our warehouses, but actually supply multiple vendors, they queue up here too. So all of a sudden, we have a request here saying, please allocate me, give me, Four books. I have ordered four books. Please give me those books. Give me a reservation for them. Put them on the side for me. That's a classic request response thing, right? Still, I want to have, I need to queue this up because of the stress that's, that's being caused. I might need to make the system more robust. So this is not a one-way thing. This is a duplex conversation, meaning here you have it. Once you're done with this, and that can be minutes later, once you, have, once you have looked into your inventory whether you have those books and you can actually make them available for me, come back and tell me. This is not request response. This is this one initiating here, and then once the response is available, this initiating the call to here. And those calls are correlated. So we have request response, which is immediate, short time window. We have uh, one way, which is very probably very long time window, probably very short time window. And we have duplex conversations, which is a, a conversation between services for a longer time frame than what can be served in request response. And then we actually have a pops up thing here too. We have a master catalog. This is where all the editors <coughs> sit and edit your, um, the reviews on the books. They edit the, the summaries on the books. They add pictures. And this is the master catalog that then gets replicated out to the website. And the master catalog also, made to, also serves to manage the inventory base levels, if you will. So the editors here, they decide which books are being carried by the vendor. And they also decide, they make an assessment how successful that book's going to be before it hits the market. Um, to do so, they also use metrics um, like pre-orders, so before that book has been coming in. So they can level up the inventory as they can, uh, when they can finally uh, order the book. And uh, all that is being fed into the inventory services by the way of so pops up, that, or that arrow is unfortunately missing here. Um, any of those inventory services makes a subscription as at the, the catalog service. It says, whenever you have any changes, additions, changes in the, in the required inventory levels, etc., please tell us. So whenever anything changes in here, all the subscribers are being notified about any change that happens in the catalog. There we have a pop up connection. All of these things need to be expressed in need to be expressed in, in contract. Contract is always a dual thing. The one-sided thing is just a special case of it. And so I would ask you to look at it that way. How much time we left until lunch? This is a quarter. Hmm? Have not? So, 
contract is the whole thing. We have two service interfaces <coughs> opposed to each other in the full case, and the contract is the whole thing. Part of the contract, so we have one-way request response dialogue, and then we have a special case, which is the P2P mesh. That's also a contract story. A P2P mesh contract would be a one contract definition that, that has itself as the callback. When I say callback, callback means each, those, this pair of contracts need to be linked to each other in some way, right? They need to be associated with each other. That's called callback contract or uh, response contract, if you, if you will. So these, have, these are opposed to each other. They have a seller contract and a buyer contract. They are linked together by means of whatever definition there is. And there's no standard for this yet, which is interesting, right? They're linked together. Now, let's assume we want to build a file sharing application, super legal file sharing application, okay? With all the DRM measures and scanning inside that knows all the evil things that you can't share legal pirated software, you can't share MP3s, you can't, basically you can't share everything, anything, but let's assume we built that anyways. You would have one contract, you have one contract which says advertise chunk, uh, get chunk, um, and a few others, right? And everybody's implementing the same contract everywhere. So you have a mesh of, of peers, any number of peers. Everybody's implementing the same contract, so everybody can call everybody, which means that a call like advertise uh, chunk, you're advertising a chunk of data that you have um, for a file, you can make a call into the mesh, and making a call into the mesh really means that you tell your local infrastructure to do an IP uh, broadcast, to create an IP broadcast, to all the people in the mesh. You just make one call, but actually call everybody at the same time. Then, whenever anybody calls back and says, hey, here, uh, actually, that's fine. I want to get from you that chunk. Then they can establish a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection to me, because they know me. Or they can say, you know, global broadcast get chunk, like call into the mesh again, so that anybody could actually respond with a respective chunk. That would be a contract that you have with unknowns um, so that you implement this. There's a, a technology in Indigo called PeerNet, which does exactly that. It, it creates peer-to-peer -peer networks instantly by uh, allowing you to use the, um, the Duke, this callback contract, this dual contract. So if you want to build your peer-to-peer -peer app, Indigo is your thing. So, when we talk about contract definitions, there's really three things that are, that are of importance, which also is important for Indigo, because Indigo is fairly closely aligned with those things. There's address, and that's about where the service is located. That's an important thing to know, right? So, that may be HTTP, server, 8080, slash endpoint, just an address, uh, or, for instance, net.tcp, server, and a different port, and the endpoint, um, that's the address. That's where we can find it. Which typically implies um, a, a certain transport, at least. Then we have bindings, and bindings take the, this, the contract, so, sorry, so take the contract definition, uh, means messages and uh, operations and all those things, and tie them to the address. The binding says, all right, here we have this abstract thing which consists of messages which go this way and this way, which consists of operations which groups those messages into this is the, this is the request, this is the response to this request which correlates them, that's, that's an operation. And now it takes this abstract thing which has nothing to do with anything except that messages that payloads are exchanged and binds them down to the transport to the address alongside with an envelope format. That envelope format, if you look at a common whistle, is typically so. But it's not limited to that. 
right? If you came up with your own, if I came up with my own envelope format and we call it breeze, that would be just fine, right? I can write a soap binding, I, I, sorry, I can write a whistle binding for that, that would just work. Nobody else would support it, and it would be very long, but I can. It's in my power to do that all at home for myself. So what is the protocol and content delivery format? That's the, what the binding expresses. It says, we have an HTTP address here, that's fine, but what's really behind this HTTP address? How does that work? Do we use SOAP? How do we use SOAP? How do we do the dispatching? Which, which are the types that we actually use? Which port, which operations do we expose? Um, examples for such bindings is the WSI Basic Profile 1.1. WSI is the Web Service Interoperability Organization. Um, the Basic Profile 1.1 mandates that the binding SOAP 1.1 with UTF-8 text encoding <coughs> and HTTPs being used. That's the binding that's all the elements of the binding. And the Microsoft profile uh, for Indigo is SOAP 1.2 with binary encoding. So binary is being put on the wire, not UDFA. Um, and TCP framing, which is a different uh, delivery format um, than HTTP. That's the MS profile for um, Indigo. That's being used when Microsoft stuff talks to Microsoft stuff only. And as soon as Microsoft stuff talks to, every, to anything else, the basic profile is used or one of the more advanced profiles. So these are the bindings which combine together all those things. A policy, um, as in addition as the thing that I mentioned um, about being sort of a little out of the scope of the developer space because it really should be a deployment thing, makes assertions about addresses, bindings, service interfaces, servers, and a lot of other things. Uh, assertions means, means it makes statements. It makes statements about them so that um, the infrastructure, the code that other people write, the people that, the code that IBM writes and BEA writes and Microsoft writes, um, that that code can control its, the way it, it works in the details. For instance, the policy defines what the exact text encoding may be. Uh, the policy defines what your authentication mechanism, mechanism ought to be and how it exactly works. The policy defines what your maximum message, si message size is. The policy defines what your throttling behavior is, meaning uh, how many concurrent calls can your service handle. The policy defines locally how many threads are you making available for your application to, to service incoming, incoming calls, etc., etc., etc. All these are mostly operational concerns that application developers, of course, need to be aware of, uh, but ultimately they are beyond their control. Many of those things are beyond their control. So policy sets are attached, associated in some way with contracts, but they are ultimately a little bit of a different thing. Right? We're going to hear about policies a little more when I talk about security, and I think I have uh, one or more slides about policy in this one as well. So. Um, here's actually you know, uh, the, the picture about it. Design time contract, I'll send a PO and you'll send a confirmation. That's clearly just a message and the contract. We deploy the, the, those services, the buyer and the seller. And now um, the organization A says their policy is when we talk to outsiders, we support X509 certificates or Kerberos session tickets for authentication. And we can do UTF-8, UTF-16, SOAP-1-1 and SOAP-1-2. Uh, SOAP We're fine with anything, right? For this particular uh, communication channel, so what would you like? And the other organization is being asked, and uh, then it comes out that the runtime contract turns out to be that we use for this particular link, we use X509 certificates for authentication, we use UTF-8, <coughs> with SOAP 1.2. So you have capabilities that you can expose. You can compare those capabilities. You can make it compatible and then um, start communicating. This, for the time being, is more or less a manual process. So you have to know about those capabilities and you need to make them compatible, um, at least in the times of WYSI. In the times of Indigo, 
um, I expect that to be a lot better, to become a lot better. There's actually a lot of opportunity there in that space. Meaning Microsoft not going to deliver all the tools that you would like to have. It, they, see, see, gaps in the product are called third party opportunities. <laughs> See, that's, that's the talent of, of business people, to actually see them, seize them, capitalize on them. And, and there's actually, if you would start a company based, based only on gaps in, in the Microsoft development platform and say, all right, this is bad, this particular thing is bad, I'm going to write a tool for it, and I'm going to create a Visual Studio plugin, and I'm going to sell that Visual Studio plugin for a hundred bucks. And you, you, you focus on plugging holes. And you, you go with the assumption that Microsoft is going to plug that hole in 18 months. Right? I think you, may, you can make plenty of money out of that business. And you can't be mad at Microsoft plugging the holes. Right? That must be understood. So with the next, with the next um, uh, Visual Studio Orcas beta, you, your job is to already anticipate what is going to suck about Orcas, right? So that you can start plugging the holes until Orcas releases this next version of Visual Studio. So that all the whippy holes that you're currently plugging, and which will be fixed, you know, your products go away, but you will have a new set of plugs for you know, the shortcomings of the next release, because there's always some things. And it's typically niche solutions, where, where Microsoft comes to you and says, yeah, but you have a very special case, right? <laughs> That's a very non-standard thing that you're doing there, all those things, right? <laughs> so, in the web services contracts, contract world, there is a place in the whole architecture um, where all the contract stuff goes, and that's in the metadata block of this entire web service architecture diagram, which has been shown to you for the last bazillion of years. There's WSDL, a much hated and much loved by others. Specification, for me it's just a tool, for others it's the world. WS policy, that's the thing I just talked about, that's a, and then policy attachment, which says, how do I can actually, how can I actually it's attach policy things to Whistle? And then WS policy assertions, that's actually some beef for policy, because policy is just, you'll see, it's a very simple thing. And then WS metadata exchange, which is formalizing the, the way how to acquire a whistle. Given an ASP.NET web service, how do you get the whistle? Say it out loud. I know, I know you know it, so, so say it out loud. Question mark WSDL. Question mark WSDL, exactly. Welcome to the service, say blah, 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 as an ex, question mark WSDL. Which standard defines that? None. Yeah, but the co well, the particular thing that you get whistle out of this, right? Nothing defines that. WS metadata exchange fixes that problem because until now there's really no standard way to get at the metadata. WS metadata exchange does that. That's a standard that's being uh, that has been written by IBM and uh, Microsoft, and it should be should have been submitted to some standard organization by now. Uh, I saw an email that all the WS standards have now been submitted, but I don't know where that was. So, this is SOAP envelope. SOAP header, SOAP body. So policy mostly affects um, the headers. Schema and WS mostly affect the message content, the message body. I will illustrate that using a small analogy. Does anybody have a pen? Do you have a pen? Right. Good. I'm going to write a little letter. <laughs> okay? It's a little hard. 
usually I would do this in, in bright red, but for the lack of a, of a big, big pen. So, and I'm going to put this into an envelope. <coughs> Putting this into an envelope. It's interesting, there's interesting, interesting things I can do with that envelope. Envelopes are a great thing because they give me room to put other things onto the envelope, like an address where it goes to, an address where it was sent from, a license. A license saying, uh, I'm licensed to send this letter through the Postal Service. The Postal Service will go and promptly put a timestamp on the license to invalidate it for further use and also to document that they have accepted it, um, I, can go and, I can go into the post office and ask for additional quality of service by uh, ways of an airmail sticker or, for instance, for reliable messaging by ways of um, certified mail with, uh, return, with uh, return receipts, right? All sorts of things I can do with the envelope. None of those things have to do with my little love letter. None of them have. It's all infrastructure pieces which make the postal service go. It's all additional metadata around my payload. All of that is here. The SOAP envelope is the direct correspondent to that physical mail letter. The header section is the outside of the letter. The body is the inside, the content of the letter. It's a payload. There is application level headers, which only the application understands. And that also exists in the world of physical mail. When I'm sending email to, or sending a post, postal mail to, let's say, Elias at Microsoft in Israel, I'm going to write you know, Microsoft Israel, um, and then Elias, attention Elias, and then you know, address, etc. The, the attention line is of no interest for the postal service at all. It doesn't matter to them. That's a purely application level header. It's an application level thing. It's a local, it's only of local interest because the dispatching, the local dispatching from the company level to the employee level is done locally. The postal service has nothing to do with that. It's just an optimization thing, right? So that I don't have to look into the message to actually see where the, where the internal destination is. It's an easier way for me to route. It scales better. So the permissible use, the permissible use of application headers in the SOAP, in the SOAP arena is, is sort of like in in that, in that analogy, right? Stuff that you would write on an envelope to improve routing is perfectly okay. Stuff that you would take out, that you would extract from your data, which, is, which you can make public in a header to improve routing is a good thing. So if the data is encrypted, right, any intermediary will likely not be able to crack the message, and they shouldn't be. However, you can expose two or three data items out of your encrypted data which are purely technical, and which allow you to actually dispatch the message based on that data into your internal infrastructure. But still, that is application level, an application level header, application level addressing information exposed into the headers. Otherwise, the analogy stands. So, policy affects mostly, except for those application level headers, which are special, affects the header section, and is defined in the header section. The application level headers would grow out of the whistle file. This is the way how you. This is why it makes sense to define headers here from here as well. All other use of headers all depends on the policy, and policy may change. See, I don't have to rewrite my letter or do anything if I send the mail from either from here or from the United States or from Germany. However, the way I need to format that letter to be the standards compliant with the local habits of the postal service may slightly differ. Because in that case, the policy of the country of origin matters. Uh, but there's an internationally accepted policy defined by the International Postal Union. And the International Postal Union, the, 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 the post offices come together and define a common policy that, so they can all operate on the same standards. 
That's the same thing we experienced with WSI, the Web, the Web Service Interoperability Organization, which is the equivalent of the International Postal Union for that, or the International Tele Telephony Union for uh, the same effect. So that's the role of policy and uh, schema and whistle in that case. So the contract, how the contract is mapped to specifications, we have XML schema. Schema is, is, uh, cares about data types. We have WSDL and parts of the XML schema, which defines messages. We have WSDL, which defines message exchange patterns, meaning in or in out or solicit response, how it's called. It means you make a call, you don't send a message though, but you're going to pick up a message. So it's out only. And uh, we have WS policy. Now we're going to do a quick run through. Did we say quarter pass or did we say half? Fine. I'm just worried about time and everybody, if people get hungry, they start storming the stage and get angry at me, so. XML schema, which you all know and love, is a very complicated, uh, totally overboard standard for specifying data types. Right? It has started out as a language for specifying XML documents. It became the general purpose, and it become it became pretty ridiculous in some corners because it's just it's unnecessarily complicated. However, XML schema, um, so many people, there were so many stakeholders in XML schema from all different sorts of angles. That's the typical example of um, 40 people, yeah, design by, design by committee, 40 people get in the room, want to design a horse, and out comes a camel, right? <laughs> so that's an old joke that I stole. Um, schema is a general purpose type definition language. It's an XML document definition language, and it's over the, I even wrote it? I can't remember? Well, fine. So it knows two fundamental constructs for types, and then one is the simple type, strings, numbers, dates. That's all it knows. It only knows about strings and numbers and dates. Numbers being the, the, base, X, the base number type in XML schema is an arbitrarily long grade number. You can, you can express the counts of all quarks in the universe easily in a single XML document field as a valid number. With all, you know, all decimals, in all precision. Uh, it's, a little, it's not very pragmatic. Therefore, you can restrict the scope of the pre-built types into meaningful, in meaningful ways. Meaning you can say, all right, so an, a 64-bit integer, right, is, has a value range from here to there. And a short int has a value range from here to here, and that's what they did, right? So you have a base type that, has, that is just a theoretical value, and then you restrict all the types down, down to, to meaningful values, and there's a base type set, which is defined in part two of the uh, schema definition um, specification, and they have a common typeset which maps to most common, common uh, um, programming languages. So these are the simple types. Complex types is data structures. You have a named thing that is cons that com that's composed of a bunch of simple types uh, or a bunch of, uh, of additional complex types. These are the two things you can define in schema. Um, those two fundamental document particles, one is elements and the other one is the one that we want to forget for the sake of uh, interoperability, right? Attributes. Attributes are the things that sit on elements and allow you to refine what you mean with that element. And um, data is typically carried when we talk about XML, data is typically carried, carried inside elements. For um, the sake of interoperability and because attributes are not easy to handle, um, they save a little space, I give you that much, but they have serious drawbacks when you use them, um, especially because you need to use two APIs, right? You need to use the element API and the attribute API of the DOM to get at all those particular things. They behave slightly different, and so uh, it's a good idea to not use attributes at all, 
if you define your own schemas. Even, even if it would be, if it hurts your heart, right, to say, here's person, complex type, and that has an ID, right? You can, you can come, you can, you can come and can enter into a philosophical, a philosophical discussion with me that takes two hours, where we will co both come to the same result and say, yes, the identifier is an intrinsic property of person per se, because it's the, pri per, the primary key, and as such, it's not a separate data element. No, no. It is really and truly an attribute of person per se. Hence, it has to be, and that's what we split. <coughs> the purist says, hence it has to be an attribute in the XML. And I say, I don't, I don't really care how the XML looks. I want everything to be an element. Right? Philosophy starts right there. It uh, stops right there. As soon as it is about the, the, the way XML looks, as people start to get aesthetic about it, the looks of XML, I tune out. Because it's, but it's pointless, right? If, if, your, if your morning breakfast entertainment, right, is to download the network dumps of last night and read them, right? <laughs> if, you, if you feel joy in reading XML dumps that go across the network, in that case, I may suggest a lot of measures uh, but not necessarily mocking up your XML to make your, happen, to make your life happier. <coughs> There's built-in types, primitive data types, um, that you have, uh, uh, that I've talked about in string, float, double, all those types are defined. And then you can define your user-defined types in schema as well. Um, here's two examples. Here's a probability type defined. It's a restriction of the type double, and it has a mean inclusive value of zero. It has a max inclusive value of 100. And uh, the, the, the closer you get to the value of 100, the better you can uh, use it to power the improbable improbability graph. <laughs> you don't read enough. <laughs> Or, or, you don't remember enough. <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, first book. Go read it again. Or, if you haven't, go buy it. It's greatly entertaining. Even, even in older age. Complex type purchase order has elements, and, in fact, an embedded complex type that is a sequence for the items. So this element here is actually of this inline type, which is a sequence of actually another complex type, so that's um, a pretty complicated way of defining a complex type. This is the same thing as if you were defining public class purchase order with an uh, embedded class uh, items with an embedded class item, right? You have a collection class and you, you nest this all together. Um, that's exactly the same thing. The reason why I'm explaining schema is it should be well known to most, uh, and if it's not, go buy Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and read that instead. <laughs> the interesting part is evolving schema. Uh, I'm going to show you tomorrow a bunch of techniques to make evolving schema easy in your programming language of choice, which I mandate to be C sharp. <laughs> Um, and that's because I'm just too, I'm too stupid for VB, right? So we, I can't re see. I can only remember about four keywords and curly braces, and that's why I can't I can't do VB. We want to allow messages and documents to evolve over time, to become more complicated, to be become more become richer. So I don't want to itch, I don't want to want to redefine schemas all the time. I've been of the, the, the hardliner, calm guy opinion that once you change anything, change the namespace, make the thing different. And then wise people from the XML community co convinced me that that's not the thing to do. Um, as long as you can make compatible changes means you add optional data. And 
really, the question is, how hard-nosed do we need to be about data? How much data do we really, really need to define a customer? How much data do we really, really need for giving out a credit? For giving out a credit, we need to have a lot of information. For storing customer, storing potential customer information for a lead, you probably don't need all that many. If you keep, catch any, any of your sales representative filling in blanks for mandatory field because they're just so known, then it's probably not a mandatory field. Because if they don't have the information, you can't mandate it. Um, so you need to make those things vulnerable, you need to be a re little relaxed, and you basically just need... Everyone's now and then, if you think about schemas, if you think about interoperability, take an hour at the beach, right? relax, and go back, and don't be so hard on us about things. right? Be a little accepting of other people's lack of data availability. A special time of that sort of evolvability and, and, and relaxedness about data is versioning. Versioning means you're running version 1.1 of my app, or better said, of my proxy, because you took my you took my whistle and you baked this into let's say a shrink wrapped application that is selling out of the supermarket. Right? You're writing a personal text advisor software. Let's assume that. Um, of course, you built in the internet update super capability. It turns out the user is never using it. There you go, you're stuck with version 1.1. However, I want to continue upgrading my server. I want to have more services. So I need to make sure that the 1.1 thing keeps working even though I'm already on version, I don't know, whatever. Because all of a sudden, with more connected systems, with this stuff going mainstream, we'll have a lot of clients, and we probably have clients we don't even know about. And we can't force upgrades, because as soon as you hit shrink wrap stuff, it's totally beyond your control. Once, you, once you are, you're in the consumer space, you are completely sold on, on whatever version you put out there. And you're going to have to support it for years and years and years, otherwise you get badly sued. So you need to have forward and backward compatible evolution, and you don't want to maintain you know, 400 different endpoints for any version that you ship. So preferably, you have one version which works with everything. That's hard to do, but not impossible to do. Um, there's incompatible evolution, so there may be things that you need to remove or add, and there's got to be a way to do this. And uh, you should uh, have schema versioning. So let's talk about the evolution features. It's rather simple. Um, the simplest way to achieve evolvability is the so-called open content model. How that works is um, we have here an element called person. That's defined by a complex type. It's sequence. It has an element name. And then the magic <coughs> element is any. And any means, you know what? If you send me more data, that's fine. It's totally cool if you do that. And if you send me more data, not only will I be totally cool with whatever you sent, but I will, con I will consider it as part of the data you give me. And if I'm sending you that data back, you'll actually get it back. So I'm creating a little bag of stuff that I don't worry about. Stuff for future extension. Stuff where you can give me anything you like and I'll be happy with it. And this says, look, what, what this specifically says in the specific case of .NET, let's, let's forget the sequence mandates, a strong sequence of this, right? That's okay. That's for the sake of the horrible standard that, that, X is, <coughs> that XML schema is. Um, but this basically says, if you want to send me a person, open up a tag and send me anything you like. The tag name, I will understand. The rest, I'll be happy with anything you can send me. I'm just not going to do anything with it. But you can send me whatever you like. And if you define that you give me a person and I update it, I will probably update the name. 
if my, if my customer, if my client likes to, and I'm going to give you back the whole thing, that, that's flexible, that's very relaxed, that's being okay with anything they, they'd like to do. If evolution looks, it looks like this, you go, have the name, and then as you evolve it, you say, whoop, well, in the, next, in the next version, I'm also going to recognize of the big bag of things that you give me, I'm also going to recognize the city. But in the back end, in the implementation, and I'm going to show you that tomorrow, uh, there's actually this bag of, of unknown stuff exists. It's a little array. So I make a call, request response, right? I'm updating a customer, getting the customer data. I'm in version, I'm talking to, I'm talking to a version three server, and I'm a one one client, right? I'm getting a big bag of data because it's very rich. All I have is this. I'm showing my fantastic UI containing two edit fields and an OK button, right? The user can manipulate all that data, name a city, say OK. I'm updating this little bag of data and send it back as it is. For the 3.0 server, it looks like I've updated the whole thing, right? Because it gets the data that it gave me back as it gave it to me. It's not edited. However, the 1.1 application can act as if it was a 3.0 application because we have shaped our schema in that way. Um, I said demo will follow tomorrow. I'm going to show you that. Um, how I'm doing that, it's really, really simple. Um, and if you, uh, okay, fine. Whistle. Web service description language, we talked about that. Whistle describes messages, operations, port apps, binding services. Whistle is typically generated for you. Only the very tough people um, actually write it by hand. Tough is one possible attribute. <laughs> um, it contains types, messages, port types, and bindings and services. There's an abstract section and a concrete section to it. The abstract section here defines data types that you can use as parameters, data types that you can use as messages per se. Message section picks out a few of those types and says, these are no messages. And port type creates a bunch of operations, pairs of input and output messages, labels them as operation names, and groups them together in a port type. Port type equals interface, operation equals method, um, and a message equals, if you like, parameters in your world. However, these are completely abstract definitions that can be used for everything. Right? The, making this concrete is service bolt this down into the network stack using the address, and binding taking this abstract thing and then say, all right, we're going to envelope this with soap, we're going to use the HTTP transport, and therefore creating the connection between the bulb and the, and the ground and this abstract definition. That's, these two things are about deployment. So we have type, message, port types, abstract, concrete, and that's it. And here's, uh, fine, I thought it was another slide. Defining for schema types, messages, port types, uh, as I explained it. Um, that's all you need to know about Whistle already. Right? Uh, contrary to um, other people who would probably do this workshop, who would probably spend two sessions on Whistle, I don't think it's all that relevant to read Whistle because there's tools for that. Um, Whistle is a horrible is a horrible standard, and you don't need to read Whistle. You need to know where you find it and where to use where to find your tools. There's, if you really want to learn Whistle, pick up a book and torture yourself. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I, would, I would rather recommend that you pick up Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and read that. Okay, and I'm going to slightly over time. Policy-driven behavior, or like that. Um, you already saw the other picture, so I'm going to show you that too. Service A, Service B, have Service B exposed to policy. It says, this is how we work, X509. So we get the in policy, we look whether the policies are compatible, this may be a manual process or an automatic process. And if we are compatible, then we're sending by applying our input, our output policy and their input policy to send a message to why where it can be processed. 
So it's about making services compatible by matching their policies and seeing whether there's a compatible path, a compatible um, uh, intersect, uh, intersecting set of capabilities that makes um, the service co call possible. Um, so what policy is, it's a framework for making statements about resources. It can be rather quick here. Um, and I'm going to show you the example right here. So that is enough for explaining it, really. Policy is little islands of statements. Right? I'm making statements about a resource. Policy, WS policy itself doesn't define any of those statements. WS policy is a very simple logical language. It's just bool, it's just boolean expressions with a little bit of a different twist. Okay? There's the policy element, which means that everything inside the policy element must be true. It's the so-called all expression. These all and policy are, are um, uh, the same, are synonymous. We see all lives inside the policy element, and the policy element stands by itself. Exactly one means one of the mentioned statements. All means all of the mentioned statements. Um, and then there's um, uh, at least one. Um, and there's also, for that one? Is that at least one or is it? No, it's one or more, exactly. One or more, exactly one, all in policy. These are the expressions that exist. So what you can do is you can combine things. You can say, okay, so for this particular um, binding, we have a security token. The type is X509 certificates with the fo following encryption algorithm. Though either those two are true or these are true, Kerberos session token together with another uh, encryption algorithm. So those two together, either one of those applies, right? And you can express using the policy, um, using the policy language, you can express preference, means what's higher preference, what's lesser preference. And you can also um, express whether the usage of such pal policy, of fulfilling the policy for the communication is actually required or not, or whether it's optional or whether it's just an information element. That's what policy defines. These things here, W security and algorithm, all these things, are not part of policy. They are part of the W security <coughs> policy standard, which goes along with W security. So this allows us to plug in security relevant pieces into policy. Policy is just this, this logical language of grouping things and pre creating preferences. That's what policy is all about. Um, policy reference is not so important. Then we have policy assertions. Policy assertions is another standard. Um, it has a set of standard assertions um, that you can embed, which makes sense for messaging. For instance, what is the text encoding used for this message? What is the language for any natural language expression used in this communication link? That's something that's important, right? I can say I can mandate a policy for a communication link where um, every human readable message that comes out of this must be German. Right? Or must be in English, or must be in Hebrew, and this is something that I mandate with this with mandate with this element, express with this element, saying this is what I need, this is required, or this would be nice. Um, you can specify certain specification versions that you support in your service. I support this in this version of WS addressing, and a message predicate where you can mandate that certain headers are always present. Um, in the incoming communication or in the outgoing, or declare that certain headers are always present in the outgoing communication. All these things are making statements about messages that you sent. And likewise, WS, there's w, WS reliable messaging policy, there's WS security policy, and all those policy um, specifications give you little statements about what the quality of the communication link is. Typically, this will all happen down deep below in the dark waters of Indigo or even of Wizzy, and you don't see it, you probably don't want to see it, and probably one person in your development organization or two need to know a little bit about how that works and make sure that it's not you. <laughs> This is, a, this is a fantastic, knowing all the details of that is a fantastic job to delegate. 
<laughs> it is a horrible piece of work. It is no fun at all. And it's just, it's just, over, it's just horribly complex. It's a waste of brain cycles. Right? So, so take, take the person who's not very social. <laughs> okay. Policy attachment basically is just a bunch, a bunch of rules how to take policy island and embed it into something else, uh, especially into Wizzle. That's so interesting. You'll see policy, you'll see policy islands spread over Wizzle, for instance, in Indigo all the time. But what the rules for that are, it's just there, and that's that's good enough. If you want to know the rules, go read W's policy attachment. But since you can't really change it anyways, <laughs> right? There's no point to it. So. Policy can be applied to whistle contract, it constructs, that's what policy attachment is for. And here you see an embedding, not so important. Dummies metadata exchange, as the last one, then I'm going to leave this lunch, um, is a, an interoperability standard for defining how do I get metadata from uh, a web service. Dummies metadata exchange basically defines one method, or two methods, um, that are supposed to be implemented by every web service as an alternate endpoint. Um, the suggestion is that you have an endpoint address, your domain slash application slash my endpoint slash, it's your endpoint address, right? And then you say slash MEX, MEX for message, metadata exchange, not for Mexico, for met metadata exchange, and from there you can simply make a GET request and there you can get your whistle, right? It's a formalized way to um, get it your whistle instead of the question mark WSL, which will continue to work at least in the Indigo. So you have a standardized way to get at this stuff. And that's about it. Policies, uh, word and security, you're going to see a, a few slides that I have which have word and security. Um, Policy is used to define security. Right? Policies and configuration files define how your system is working. Uh, these are all configuration items. You should never forget when you're writing, writing systems, when you think about those things, that these are config files which are deployed, which are typically sitting in the file system. And those need to be secure. These need to be as secure as your content files, um, especially because they contain the sensitive information that is very valuable for how to crack your system. So this needs special attention. Um, even more so, uh, administrators may be inclined, no, operators may be inclined to tinker around with them. So uh, the config files need probably higher protection than any of the content files around um, because they are very, very sensitive. Policies, config files, all those things. Um, you should never forget to that this is your this is the hacker's way in, right? Attack your system at the weakest spot, and that's retrieving all those settings is of course a, a problem, right? It's a weak way. If you make that file writable um, for anyone, they can override that file. Once they have, once they override the file, they can come in through the door. So that's something that's important. We have our our security expert uh, Michael Villas has sort of went through all the decks and uh, has looked at uh, security relevant things. He also designed the, with a brand new security deck um, that I hope I'll be able to actually do tomorrow. We'll see, I have to read it tonight over and over and over again. Um, after I have already tried to learn all those things that he, Michael is telling me. And uh, so he's uh, always making us aware of uh, things that are sometimes we don't think you don't think about. So technology mapping, lastly, is something I'm going to do tomorrow when I talk about ASP.NET Web Services and Web Service and WSI and Indigo and therefore I'm done with this contract section. The key takeaway is contracts are not a single thing, there's multiple shapes, there's many shapes of how communication can work. This is sort of the structural engineering of your application. There you are an architect building the structural integrity of, of the house that you're building. That's all the communication paths and patterns. This, this is how you set your, build your scalability, if you will, build your security also, um, how you build your robustness. 
and uh, that's how you, that's what you sit down in the contract. That's what you sit down in the contract also on on duplex contracts, thinking about how things can can have conversations instead of master and, and slave relationships, etc. <coughs> um, and contracts are important to do this. Again, contracts are not only whistle, uh, they're not only XML. Um, there are also a greater thing about negotiating between partners that there's a legal aspect to it. Um, Whistler and XML being the most popular and one key takeaway and it's something that I'm gonna that I'm gonna stress um, tomorrow very strongly that's that's the interoperability and evolution angle um, where you want to define data types that are evolving over time doing that's not so and it's not so very hard. So uh, Achim will be next after lunch with uh, autonomy, if I'm not mistaken, okay? And until then, we have lunch of how long? Uh, okay, so the initial plan is until 2.30. <laughs> and then, you know, give or take.